Welcome to episode three of our dedicated NUFC podcast. Now, when I describe Walker's finest to you, it probably signifies the snack made famous by a certain Gary Lineker. But Toon fans, it will mean cons- something completely different in today's legendary guest. Welcome to Black and White with Arab News. Forget Burger King and Nick Pope. It's time to introduce a man that puts the big into Mac and the Arab into news. It's our very own sport editor, Ali Khaled. AK, how are you? A clean sheet, by the way, on the South Coast. Yeah, it was uh, it was a, a very resilient performance. I mean, I, I thought uh, last week when we were chatting, I thought the Newcastle would, would even have a chance of winning it. You know, um, although obviously Brighton were coming off that uh, brilliant result against Man United. I still thought Newcastle, you know, had enough possibly uh, to win it before. But uh, the way the match went, I thought uh, the defending was brilliant. Uh, Nick Pope was, was fantastic as well. So uh, all, all in all, you know, a nil-nil draw against a team that's flying is, uh, is a great result. And four points out of the first six, no complaints. It's what we asked for. Time to welcome today's guest, a man as black and white as the club badge. Lee Clark, how are you? I'm good, Pete. Hi, Ali. Hi, Lee. How are you doing? Good, it, thanks. Can't believe it's been so long since you've been on the podcast, but we've got you. Uh, we pinned you down. Um, listen, impressed with the start of the season? Very, very impressed. As Ali said, four points from the first six, two clean sheets, uh, a terrific performance against Forrest from the first minute to the last. And as Ali rightly pointed out there, a very resilient performance down at Brighton and helped by an outstanding performance by Nick Pope in the in the goals. It's not it's it's difficult to get points anywhere in the Premier League, but certainly Brighton, who like Newcastle had a terrific start of the season with a win at Old Trafford, it was always going to be a tough game. So uh it, you know that was uh, very, very important. And uh yeah, four points from six. Looking forward to a massive game on Sunday against Man City now with uh, lots of expectation. Ali, as tough a test as it is, comes this weekend. As Lee's just said, it's it, everyone's full of expectancy because of those four points on the board. We've talked about free hits in the past, but Eddie will want to test his squad against the best this weekend, won't he? Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, you know, it's a good time as well to, uh, you know, to test, as you say, to test his squad and to to go for it because you know the the, the team is in good shape. You know, they're confident. It, it, I, I know what you mean when you say like a free hit, you know, no one, you know, it, you know, should you lose this? I don't think anyone would be, you know, too surprised or too disheartened. I and mean, they shouldn't be, you know, uh, but, you know, why not go for it as well? You know, I think we we saw last season near the end, uh, I mean, Newcastle were, you know, had already sort of almost, uh, you know, uh, were safe when they played Liverpool and Manchester City in consecutive games, you know, and like, and they fell short a little bit in, in, in both. Uh, but this is a completely different team, I think, now. I think it's a lot more confident, a lot more, um, uh, you know, cohesive. I think, I think you know, you, you wouldn't expect to concede too many goals. Um, uh, you know, well, they haven't, conceded a, they haven't conceded a goal yet this season. Yep. So, I mean, you know, th- this might change, probably will change against Man City. But, uh, but again, I mean, I don't think they should go in there expecting... Right, you know, uh, like a thrashing or anything like which we would probably a year ago. That's exactly what we would have thought. Uh, I think uh, they'll go in confident, and uh, yeah, they've got nothing to lose. I told him exactly right. Uh, Lee, a nice problem to have if Matt Target returns. Eddie's got a choice then between Botman, Byrne, and Shaw. And I wanted to bring up Dan Byrne, a player that you know very well. Yeah, um, as, as you know, Pete um, took him uh, in his young career to uh, Birmingham. And he was exceptional for me, um, you know, for the first six months of that season. We were just on the fringes of the uh, playoffs. And Dan was uh, one of four or five loan signings who got recalled. You know, when you do a season-long loan, there's always a clause in that contract that the, the, the parent club can look at it or the, the loan club can look at it for a week in January and decide whether they want to continue with that season-long loan. That was a big setback. But I could tell then Dan was a terrific boy, great attitude, uh, trains the way he plays, absolute winner in everything he does, you know, treats everything like it's a match and uh, a great lad. 
But I think he, even myself has been su- surprised by the uh, consistency, what he's shown since he's come in. He's been outstanding. And that's why I wasn't surprised last weekend against Forrest when, when Dan got the call and, and Botman was, was on the bench. And mm. I think uh, Eddie's shown that with Gamirez last season. You know, gets these lets these players level up from the touchline, see what the Premier League's all about. But as you said, the injury to target against Brighton allowed Botman to come in. Dan went left back, shows the versatility, shows the strength and depth of the squad, which is a terrific sign and a great one for Eddie. And he's got what you, what all managers want. He's got a real tough decision on on Sunday. Now, what it, what it does give him is it gives him that flexibility because if he ever wants to go with three centre backs, he's got Shaw, Botman, and Byrne. Target, target, and trip the LV your wing backs. You know that would be an exciting five. Um, if you want to make it a bit more solid, but still having that uh, flexibility to attack, because I think you'll see a completely different approach from the uh, previous two managers to play in Manchester City at home. I know we've got a two-one victory under Rafa, um, under in his reign against Man City. Uh, in a night game I was there and it was a terrific performance and it was one of the few times we went at uh, one of the big six uh, even home or away and uh, I think Eddie is a manager especially at home where he'll want the players to play on the front foot but also you know you obviously have to have an eye on what's going on behind you because these this team, Man City, have such quality in terms of they can hit you on the break so quickly. They have such speed in the team. They have great movement, but they have players who can travel with the ball quickly and with quality. And you've got Haaland's movement who wants space in behind. You've got De Bruyne's passing ability. So that can hurt you. But I think Newcastle will go for it. I think Newcastle will ask, try and ask questions of Manchester City. As Ali said, whether that's enough, we don't know. Probably not. I think most teams... When they come up against City the way they are, you know, even if they have a go against them. But in the past, especially under the, you know, the previous management, we sat back, we played with a low block, we sat deep and we still got battered. We yeah. still, you know, we're, we're still, our goalkeepers were becoming man of the match. We still having to make 10, 12 top saves and we're still letting in three or fours. So why not have a go at them and see if we can cause them problems? Because, you know, you know, if you play a low block, especially in your home ground, where the atmosphere now at St. James is absolutely electric, it's brilliant. And if you're going, you know, playing at your home ground and playing like that, when you're playing against world-class players, they will find a way of getting through you eventually. You know, if, they, if you keep letting them have the ball two-thirds high up the pitch, as I said, at De Bruyne, at Foden, uh, you know, with their passing ability and their movement, um, you know, Mares with his trickery one and one, then obviously Harland with his power and his pace. And people talk about he needs lots of space in behind, but if you remember, he's the, when he won the penalty at West Ham, he didn't have a lot of space in behind. He just came a yard as if he was going to receive the ball, spun very quickly, great little slide rule pass down the side, and they got the penalty. So he doesn't need a lot of space to work in either. So if, if what, what, what with Manchester City, with, with all these top teams who end up having a lot of possession, that defenders don't get used to being worked. I mean, as a, as a defensive unit because they're used to having the ball. So when you ask them questions sometimes, you know, they can't always come up with the answers. And I think certainly when you play these teams at home, it's worthwhile going for them. And as, as you rightly pointed out, but Eddie will never say this because as a manager, you approach every game and think you can win every game. Not any, you know, most people going to that game aren't expecting Newcastle to win. They just want to see a positive performance. And if Newcastle do that, and they come unstuck to world-class players and a world-class team with a world-class manager, that's fair dues. They've had a go. You move on to the next one. So, you know, that's uh, that's will, uh, that, that, that's what I'm hoping will happen and I think will happen on Sunday. Ali? Yeah, I just wanted to add a quick point to what Lee was saying is that, you know, playing at home as well these days, I mean, the support at St. James Park is brilliant. You know, it's been, you know, it's, uh, it's it, the fans have always been behind the team, obviously, um, on match day. But there was a time when, as Lee mentioned, when the team didn't give them much to, to, to be excited about. Like if they sat back against the big teams, there was not much excitement in, this, in the stands. But that's not how this team plays. Eddie Howe will be on the front foot. You know, they will give the fans something to shout about. You know, the fans will get behind them. And it, you know, it becomes like a, you know, you know, a positive cycle you know, that feeds into itself. So, you know, again, 
you know, we, we always used to talk about, you know, should the fans lift the team or should the, the team lift the fans? And at the moment, you know, it's it's working well. And playing at home, being at home, maybe, you know, had it been at the, uh, uh, at the Etihad, you know, maybe you'd be really under the cost. But playing at home, the fans should give them a bit of a lift as well. Brilliant. Looking forward to it. And, and for the first time, as you say, looking forward to it, going into it, thinking there's a possibility of a result, not thinking I want to get the, the weekend done and out of the way. It's a, it's exciting times both on and off the pitch. Speaking of off the pitch, Lee, uh, we speak about strengthening as an example. And at the weekend, it just shows that there's still a job to be done in the transfer market. Because if you take a couple of big players that are just less than 100%, it does show, um, you know, I'm not wanting to criticise them, but by his own standards, Bruno came out and said that about the, he wasn't happy with his performance. You, I picked up on an interesting point you made last week. Everyone's going, oh, Shelby's out, go and get a midfielder. There's a ready-made one there and a local lad who looks a bit better under Eddie, doesn't he? Yeah, Sean Longstaff's improved immensely with the coach. You know, uh, Eddie and his staff are giving him, looks like he's got his confidence back, looks like the player that broke onto the scene. But for me, I think it, it, the priorities at the moment have to be another striker to one uh, you know, can be a replacement for Callum Wilson or play alongside him. Like we've just talked about the flexibility of having a back three uh, or, or play with two centre-backs. It, it gives you the flexibility if you get a quality striker, whether you play with two strikers and, 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 and you know, play in the, in, the, in, the, in a different way, 3-5-2 or 4-4-2, or the striker comes and is, is there when Callum you know, is feeling a little bit tired in the games, you can replace him or you want to give him a rest because unfortunately with Callum, he's an outstanding player, he's an outstanding lad. Um, he does have a history of having injuries and, yeah. you know, we can't get away from that fact. So for me, the priority is the striker and the, and the way Eddie plays, and I know this for a fact, I've come up against these teams before and managed against them. He, li- he likes a lot of pace in the wide areas and I think the winger in a, in a striker at this moment in time are priority. If he can do them, and still have room to get another centre midfield player in uh, to to cover that area when jo- while John Joe's out. But I think it's what you've got to think about as well is if you do sign another midfield player, then when John Joe comes back, what what you're going to do then? Because you're going to have five or six central midfield players then, and not even all of them are going to get on the bench. So then your man management has to come into the play, and that's what you've got to think about as well. It's and it has to be right. It has to be the player has to be right. It cannot just be, oh, we'll sign the player just to cover with for twelve weeks while John Joe's out. This player has to be a long term signing as well. So, and if that's not the case, surely there's a an up and coming youngster from the um, under twenty ones who can be that other player that plays in the centre of the pitch and you know use him from the bench, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for me, wide player and striker are priorities. And then we can look at the centre midfield because I think Sean's now give Eddie an opportunity where he can just relax a little bit. And and when you touch on the Guimera thing, listen, all you can do as football players is give of your very best. If you give absolutely everything, nobody can have any complaints. Players are not robots. It, Gramirez, it doesn't matter who you are, the, the top players in the world, they, they, they kind of play to the level Gramirez has set. He set such a high standard. He's not going to reach that every week. You know, his standard against Forrest was phenomenal. Yeah. This player is going to go down as one of the very best the club's ever seen. No doubts about it. You know, the, the, he excites me. Obviously, I played in that position. He's an unbelievable footballer. And, uh, you know, I love his honesty. He's got high standards. When he come out with that tweet, that's great. You know, he's got a strong relationship with the fans. And I think that's another thing Eddie needs credit for. He's built that relationship between the players and the fans and him and his staff and the club. Again, it's... It looks like it's unbreakable. That's brilliant. That's what you need. Um, but, you know, he, if you, as a player, think, OK, the technical side wasn't up to scratch today, but I still give everything, which he did, because he helped the team get a, a, a good point. Yeah. And I can't ask any more. He'll come, you know, I think he loves Sunday. He loves being up against the big boys. He loves testing himself against these players he's coming up against. And I think you'll see him thrive on this match on Sunday. Looking forward to that. Can't wait for it. It, it. As you say, it's a massive stage for Bruno. Ali, something else that we discussed last week, we talked about the goalkeepers. And I think that obviously, again, as as he has been in every decision, Eddie was justified again. Nick Pope had a great, a, a phenomenal game by, by, mm. by all accounts watching it. But 
again, Eddie, you know, vilified in in in, play, in playing Pope as his number one. Yeah, I mean, you know what? Uh, before the season started, before the Nottingham Forest match, we were discussing, you know, will he stick with Dubravka, who had had a great preseason. I went for Pope because I thought, though I, I doubt Eddie Howe has given anyone assurances, you know, that they'll be first choice. Uh, it was a big signing. It was like a, a statement signing getting uh, Nick Pope. And, you know, someone who's got ambitions to be uh, England's number one, who I think is probably, you know, in my opinion, a better goalkeeper than uh, Jordan Pickford. Uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think he shouldn't, you know, while other players like even Bruno had to wait and um, uh, and maybe other players, you know, will also have to wait their, their chance to come in, like Botman waited that first match, you know. I think with with Nick Pope, it made sense, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a signing, you know, that had, you know, number one written all over it, really, you know. So, uh, and um, absolutely vindicated uh, by playing him. And, um, you know, imagine a year ago saying, you know, starting the season with four points, no goals conceded as well. You know, I mean, that is massive, you know, I mean, would, would please him so much because that's one of the things that he worked on, that Eddie Howe worked on right from the beginning was like getting the defense right. Absolutely. Great to see him and great to see him in action on social media with Burger King. Can't, can't not give that a mention. Absolutely phenomenal. Just somebody put what's better on Twitter. What's Burger King actually had, had tweeted. What's better than Gherkins and tomorrow. Someone put Nick Pope. And then off it went. It was running and it, it ended with the guy who originally tweeted Nick Pope getting free burgers from McDonald's, free bets from Bet365, you name it. It was trending for a day. Nick Pope, welcome to Newcastle because this is what the fans do. It's absolutely mad. Um, Lee, it's a hectic schedule for the Black and Whites coming up. City, Liverpool, Wolves as well. And there's a cup game on the horizon that I wanted to quiz you about. It brought back memories for me. Tramir in the cup, can you remember that bonkers night? 6-6, six, six, I think you were on the score sheet as well, weren't you? Yeah, I got a couple that night. And do you know what was significant about that night, Pete and Ali? Go on. It was the first ever live Sky football match. Brilliant. What a fact. Wow. And it started off with a 6-6 six, six draw, then going to penalties. <laughs> <laughs> if ever one game summed up the Aussie ordeal is, Ray, and that was one, it was phenomenal. It was when we're talking about going to the tour, that's the way Ozzy was, you know, he, he brought some great youngsters through and he gave us our heads and he gave us confidence, but we didn't have the know-how. We had one or two older heads, but we didn't have enough. And we used to be involved in these games where we used to be high score. I remember being 3-0 up against John at St. James's and losing 4-3. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, ultimately, yes, the fans realised Ozzy had to leave and everyone knew the results were plummeting down the league. But, no, never once did the fans turn on Aussie Ordealers. The seen what he was trying to do with the young players, the seen the exciting football, but the end result wasn't there. And that shows you if you're trying to do the right thing and the results don't happen, the crowd will try and keep behind you and appreciate it. Obviously, they became worried because, we, as I said, we come slipping down the league. I think another factor was when it, when the when the news came out eventually a couple of years after Aussie left that. Ozzy initially paid for David Kelly out of his own money and interest-free loan to the club and then got that back further down the line when Sir John took over, showed his, showed his commitment to the club as well. How many managers would, would do that, you know? Um, and, what a signing, by six, the way. <laughs> exactly. That 6-6 six, six game was terrific. And for me, in, uh, in, in terms of a lot of the cup games we had, or when Tramia were in the Championship, which they were for a long period, when we were there, I think the year we got promoted, they were there. Tramia was, Trenton Park was always a happy hunting ground for myself personally. Got on the score sheet quite regular. So, yeah, that, that one obviously wrote a few memories. But as you say, that 6-6. Six, six, I think, did Quinny get a hat-trick that night um, as well? He did. You know that, the uh, other stat from that, it was it was young Redder's first ever away game. Ah, right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a game to go to, Ali. Yes, I mean, it was literally, I don't think, I, I, I would have to watch it back on YouTube. I know at one point there was there were 2-1 down, then it was 2-2, two, two, then there were 3-2. At one point, I don't think they even went 5-3 up. It was, it was you just remember, incredible. Uh, can you remember the commentary on that? It was it was Ron Atkinson, big Ron, famous big Ron in there. Kevin Brock had to go off in the commentator said, yes, Kevin Brock's had to go off with a, with a headache. And Big Ron says, oh, I hope it doesn't keep him out too long. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, just, <laughs> Big Ron. 
amazing days. And I do remember because I, I again going to Prenton Park when when the entertainers were just about to get promoted. And a, another friend of ours in Dubai, Ali Eric Nixon, was in goal that day, Lee, and you won three nil. It was on the Sunday. I think Rob Lee was amongst the goals as well. Fantastic memories. So Tramir in the cup. Um, Liverpool coming up as well, uh, Ali. So I'm going to hand over this one to you because it, it is your team and it's always a special occasion, isn't it? And um, Liverpool, Newcastle, early on in the season. Liverpool... I love, I, I've, I've always loved the, the Liverpool Newcastle match. I mean, obviously, like the the you know the history of entertaining games since the Keegan uh, Keegan days. I always remember the, the 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 one that really stuck in my head was the three 0 at St James's Park when um, uh, when Andy Cole scored a hat trick. You know, identical goals, uh, um, and you know that always struck with me because that for me that was like a real introduction to uh, to the entertainers, you know. But obviously, like then came uh, the 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 two four three wins at Anfield. There was another four two win at Anfield. You know, there's been some absolutely amazing. It's one of my favorite fixtures, you know, whether it's at St James's Park or at Anfield, you know. So, uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. And just wanted to, you know, ask, uh, Lee, you know, there's a young lad making a name for himself at Anfield these days, uh, uh, your uh, your son, Bobby. Uh, we've been keeping an eye on him, uh, Peter and I, for a few months uh, and at the end of last season, doing really well for the under-23s. And and uh, it was on the bench for the last game uh, against Crystal Palace, didn't, you know. So uh, you must be very proud of his development, uh, Lee. Ali, it's been amazing. Um, you know, people remember this. I was staying with him and his mum and dad, his family, uh, this time last year. Um, and we watched him and his signing ceremony when he when the move was officially happened and uh, they'd done the ceremony. So to think less than a year's down the line, he's getting on the bench uh, for a Premier League game. It is a phenomenal, you know, um, achievement. We When we looked at it and I spoke with him, his ambitions probably at this time of the year, this time in, in this progression was probably to be, you know, challenging and irregular in the under 23s, which has now gone back to under 21 football. Right. So for him to be playing regular there, but also he's training every day with the first team now. He's getting more confident. He's learning from world class players. He's learning from a world class manager and coaching team. He's loving every minute of it and he's, you can see the confidence is starting to build, but he's, he's starting to improve in so many aspects of his game. Um, it's proved to be a, a terrific move for him. And, uh, you know, when you're 17 and you've been at the club for less than a year and you're getting put into to under the substitute bench for one of the, you know, biggest clubs in the world and one of the best teams in the business at the moment. Yeah, granted, they had, they've had a difficult start. Two draws is not what they expect at Liverpool. But still, um, you know, it, it, it's great. And he, he's just got to keep going um, and, and and keep catching the eye of, of the manager, and that, whether that's in training, whether that's with the under-21s, and make sure when, when he gets that opportunity. Because um, the manager's got history of giving young players a chance. You know, we talked about the, the midfield situation at Newcastle. Well, obviously, there's a lot of injuries at Liverpool at this moment in time. But what we have, you know, at Liverpool, they have many injuries as well, uh, certainly in the attacking areas in midfield. And um, what what Klopp's come out and said is that the, the right player isn't available and I'm not prepared to just bring in a stopgap. I've got good youngsters who I've got trust in and I'll give them a chance. And that's, that's a brilliant you know, think to have for me as a parent or as a young player, when you're a manager of a top, top club and you're expected to win every game, every game you're expected to win um, and you're going to give the, the opportunity uh, rather than just go out and buy a stock gap midfield player while your injury list uh, recedes and to get players back is to give these youngsters a chance and, and, and that's what he's done in the past and he's still doing it and I think that was one of the main reasons Bobby decided on Liverpool being his destination when he had some other choices to make. So, uh, absolutely delighted how it's gone. You know, there's a lot more progress to be done, a lot more hard work, but uh, couldn't be happier on how the the first just under a year has gone for him. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Lee, just to add to that, about Klopp. Klopp last season, I mean, you know, everybody got caught up in the whole quadruple thing and obviously rival fans enjoyed that Liverpool didn't get it and all that. But one thing you have to give 
Klopp massive credit for. I mean, it was an absolute masterclass throughout the season of how to utilize God. Earlier on in the season, in the you know when they were playing the the League Cup games and the early rounds of the FA Cup, he would utilize a lot of the younger players, you know, and then they, you know some of them would be on on the bench for uh, for Premier League matches, and they would come on. You know, obviously Liverpool were doing really well, winning a lot of matches. They would come on into a team that's confident. You know, they, you're, you're throwing on kids at a time when the team's winning, the team's confident, so they're gaining all this like really really positive uh, experience. And uh, you know, obviously as the season progressed and you get into the the last couple of months, you start playing the first team. You know, like the, the, you know, sort of, you know, fade out to the, you know, but, but overall, you know, for Liverpool to actually go into the last week of the season with the four trophies on the line was, was an absolute masterclass and a big part of that, a masterclass of utilizing the squad, I should say. And a big part of that was using all those young kids. So best of luck to Bobby. Absolutely. Um, just the last bit touch on this uh, subject. That they have a clear pathway, they have a, a clear system of how to do things, you know. Harvey Elliott is now a huge player at the football club, a very, very important player, and he still you still forget how young he is. But what they've done with Harvey is they brought him in and they, they started him a couple of times from the bench. He had a couple of cup starts, etc. And then they decided to send him on a season-long loan to Blackburn Rovers, which was fantastic. He worked under Tony Mowbray, had a terrific season at Blackburn, was one of the standout players in the Championship, came back to Liverpool and was then an accomplished first team player but still you know stop start in terms of Jürgen give him an opportunity to start and put him on the bench now I watched him on Monday evening he was probably the standout player for Liverpool he looked very very accomplished you wouldn't believe how young he was when you seen what he was doing how mature and they're doing the same with a boy called Tyler Morton Tyler played in the Champions League last season he had a few starts in the Premier League had lots of substitute appearances you know um, was one of the lads on the pre-season tour, done the same, and now he's gone to Blackburn Rovers on a season-long loan. So for me, this shows that there's a process in place, there's a pathway, there's a system that they use, and, they, and then this is to all benefit um, their players. And another thing that they do is that they have a pathway for players who unfortunately don't make it at the level Liverpool are expecting. You know, not every player is going to, be at the standard Liverpool need. But you, you don't want to have those boys in your club and they just go away and they, they, they lose their career. You know, Nico Williams gets sold for 17 million to Nottingham Forest. Harry Wilson got sold to Fulham a couple of years ago for 12 million. So they, they end up having great careers elsewhere. And this is because of the the upbringing they have and the coaching and the, and, and the standards uh, that are set at Liverpool. So, you know, it, it all bodes well for whatever, whichever. Uh, Root Bobby's career takes, you know, there's, there could be great opportunities for him. Massive opportunities and a huge, as you say, Lee, quite rightly, standards being set at the very highest level, which is brilliant to hear. OK, we, are, we have to ask, Lee, give us a prediction for Sunday. Well, I'm never, ever going to say that Newcastle are going to lose. Um, you know, never going to go to a game and certainly the expectations this time. I'm, I'm excited about the game. I'm looking forward to Newcastle taking them on. Um, so I think we'll go. I'll go for a score draw. Um, it'll be an amazing feat if we can get the victory, but we've done it before, and you know everything's possible um, in football. But I think realistically, we get a score draw and we'll keep the momentum going and uh, the positivity. The atmosphere is going to be electric. I'm loving. I love going to the games now. I, I get there early, and I, you know. Around the city centre, everyone's got a smile. The joke, the crack's great. Everyone's buzzing, looking forward to the, the getting to the ground. You get in twenty minutes before the game. The war flags, um, uh, you know what they are doing. It's amazing. Got to mention that they're, they're doing a, a war flags are doing some flags and banners to on Sunday to uh, to to back show racism the red card. So you know that would be a fantastic. Sure that they'll put on on Sunday for that. So I'm back in that one as one of the patrons. And uh, so looking forward to seeing that. So, yeah, really buzzing for the game. Really excited. Brilliant stuff. Uh, a real Newcastle legend and entertainer, Lee Clark. Always brilliant. Sure, we'll see you before the end of the season. Ali, as always, last word goes to you. There's a very special sporting weekend that awaits us. The rage on the Red Sea takes place in Jeddah. Uh, the place is buzzing, isn't it? Yes, the heavyweight championship of the world uh, on Saturday night between Yusek and, uh, and uh, Joshua. Uh, it's been they've they've had a whole week of build up and it's 
it's absolutely gone mad there for for this uh, massive massive uh, event uh joshua has fought in the in the past the rematch against uh, ruiz a, co- a few years back and when he retained his his world title and this is what he's hoping and he's been saying all week uh he's been in jeddah for for the last month he's uh, he's been training well really really settled like a lot of positive comments coming out of his camp um you know from eddie hearn as well who we spoke to a few days ago with arab news and um you know they, they they're expecting well i mean hoping that you know history will repeat itself and he will re- will get retain his title in in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so yeah, massively exciting. Really looking forward to that. Okay, and last question is this, Ali. You're on a bit of a roll yourself, but my question to you is: Can the tune land a knockout blow themselves at the weekend? Mm. So I was going to go. I'm going to be realistic and go for a, a Newcastle win. You know, uh, sorry for a Manchester City win, I should say. Um, but um, but uh, you know what? Last week, my predictions were abysmal. So, so I'm going to go for you know. I, I think, I think I'm going to go with Lee on this one. Um, why not? I think a two-two draw. Okay, goals are plenty. I'm, yeah, I remember a two-two draw a few years ago as well. If I remember correctly, John Joe Shelby scored a scored a great goal. You know, this is a better team. You know, maybe City is a better team as well. But I think you know, with the positivity, playing at home, why not two-two? Why not? Let's go for it. Brilliant, as always, to see Lee Clark. Ali, superb to have you on the podcast, as always. That's it from another edition of Black and White with Arab News. We'll see you next week. How are the lads? <laughs>